This is Episode 4 of Talking With, Brian Lamb's conversation with historian Richard Norton Smith. It starts after this. Let's go back to the books for a while. Um, you had the book in 82, 84, 86. The last one was Harvard. Then what was the next one after the Harvard? Yeah, well, the, 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 Dole, the Dole autobiography, it was called Unlimited Partners. And that was before the 88. And that was on the verge of the, yeah, and the, on the eve of the 88, which he always said, by the way, he, he later on said 88 was his year. And, but, you know, he, he, of course, was nominated in 96 to run against Bill Clinton. And he said, in retrospect, he he shouldn't have run. But you wrote with their names on it, or are you, you are you credited with writing? Yeah, but I was, you know, with, with? with exactly. Um, and it was an interesting it was an interesting experiment. Um, I'm not sure I'd be eager to do it again um, because there are two. First of all, above all, you want authenticity. I mean, so many Washington books, and you know, so many campaign books are. Um, are utterly predictable, um, and and I I knew these two people quite well. I thought, and they were interesting. They were, in many ways, more interesting than their public personas, uh, but they were above all distinct. I mean, I know they were thought of at the time as the power couple in Washington, but I saw them as two very distinct individuals, very different. Who, in many ways learned from and complimented and, and filled out, if you will. Um, that's where the, the, the package came from. But um, uh, that meant two very distinct voices. It wasn't my voice. It was their voice. And, you know, I, I think given the limitations of the genre, and, it, and those are profound, I think we, uh, we broke some ground. Um, the book was actually surprisingly well Reviewed. Of course, sales were cut off when, when he when he dropped out of the race. So anyway, they they expanded it. Didn't rewrite it, but expanded it um, eight years later. Uh, I also uh, worked with the senator on two books of political humor. One called "Laughing Almost All the Way to the White House," which was a lot of fun. And then we ranked the presidents as humorists. Who was number one? Boy. Or two or three or the f- top five. Well, I know um, there was a correlation. I think Lincoln was number one. There was a correlation between presidential success and a sense of humor. I mean, so, for example, um, well, obviously Reagan was, was uh, Lincoln, Reagan, FDR, who had a, 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 a sense of the ridiculous. And you something those are essential it seems to me, to any politician, to survive in the unreal and self-important world in which they find themselves. Who, who didn't have a sense of humor? Or who would you put on the bottom of the list? Jefferson had, among successful, if you think of the figures on Mount, on Mount Rushmore, Jefferson had very little, very little sense of humor. Um, and <laughs> it's only one of the things that I would hold against him. Um, but on the other hand, Washington, in a sense, couldn't allow himself. He was very keenly uh, self-aware, uh, aware of the image and, and how important that was to defining the office and, it's, in a sense, the young republic. And so uh, uh, he had a sense of humor. He appreciated humor, but he, he wasn't one to tell jokes. On the other hand, T.R. had this um, swashbuckling... Um, wit, um, and of course Lincoln is um, the president. There is in all other ways against which all others are measured. But there were so I there were surprising figures. Coolidge, right near the top. Coolidge had this wonderful dry Vermont humor, so dry. Uh, uh, Will Rogers once said that Coolidge wasted more humor on people than anybody else. People didn't realize he was being funny or he was pulling their leg. Rogers understood it. He had the same kind of rural, you know, experience and outlook. But Coolidge and Hoover, it was the most surprising. Hoover had a marvelous sense of humor. Um, And, um, uh, you know, 
everything from fishing to you know the letters to children. I mean, this very kind of dry chuckle. It wasn't a guffaw kind of humor. He didn't tell stories, but I uh, had a gentle wit. After '88, next book. Well, then I went from Simon and Schuster to Houghton Mifflin, and uh, I uh, it began to be <laughs> longer intervals between books. You have to remember, all this time I'm running presidential libraries. So I have this full time, and in fact, in, in 99, the, the next book, one reason why I was late, was um, the book that you knew, uh, a book on George Washington called Patriarch, which was published in 1993. I was running not one, but two libraries at that time. Uh, the Hoover Library, which was in the midst of putting a 12,000 foot edition onto the building and redoing the whole museum. But also, I was running for a year out of Abilene, Kansas, the Eisenhower Centenary for the National Archives, which was the ultimate sacrifice I, I think I ever made for a job, or certainly for the archives. I lived in the Sunflower Hotel um, for 11 months. I, rem I remember I arrived on Pearl Harbor Day, 1989, which somehow in retrospect seemed uh, appropriate. Um, and I was there until the, the day after Ike's 100th birthday. I left on October 15th. And in between, I made a few dashing trips back to West Branch. But I was in Abilene, which was a very small town, geographically in the middle of nowhere. Kansas. With a profound sense. Town of, you know, it was about 6,000 people. And I've never been in a place with a more profound class consciousness. Someone who shall remain nameless, who was a wonderful co-worker of mine. There were, there were a few restaurants in town, and one was in a, a delightful, restored Victorian home. It was called the Kirby House. And it was, you know, by Abilene standards, kind of upscale, as much for the surroundings as the food. And I took the staff to lunch, periodically. I remember I, we, had a, we had a birthday party for Woodrow Wilson on December 28th, which People attended um, quizzically, but in any event, I would take, I would find excuses and take people to lunch. Because uh, remember, I was the outsider, had been parachuted in. I, I know there were people who resented my being there, and at the same time, very little had been planned. The only thing that was planned when I got out there was a tree planting on the 14th of October. And we actually, we put about 40 events together including an amazing conference on race relations in the 50s, where Orville Faubus, Herbert Brownell, and four members of the Little Rock Nine came together in Abilene, Kansas, to relive that experience. I mean, but anyway, but the, this, this co-worker uh, one day was one of three or four people who joined me for lunch at the Kirby House. And afterwards, I, she didn't tell me, but she told people it got back to me. She said, I've never been in the Kirby house. It's like people had this sense of, you know, they were, ironically, Ike had been born on the wrong, born, he was born in Texas, but he lived as a boy on the wrong side of the tracks. Well, there was this profound, and, and again, small towns harbor very large contradictions. I mean, I grew up in one, and I think it maybe gave me some insights I've lived in a number of small towns. Well, I wanted to do that. First of all, just to put it all in context, yeah. the, all the libraries, if you can remember, uh, let's start at the beginning and give the years. The yeah, Hoover, Hoover was what year? It was 1987 until 1993, with a year out uh, for the Eisenhower Centenary. Um, and then I went to Reagan. What year? 93, early 93, until 90. No, actually, it was late 93, uh, until 96. And at that point, I went to Ford and was there until the end of 2001. Grand Rapids, Michigan. In, that's right. The, the, um, uniquely and unfortunately, President Ford, thinking like a congressman, split the facility. It's the only split facility in the system, and it will never happen again. Uh, the library is located in Ann Arbor on the campus of the University of Michigan, which makes sense. It's, it's his alma mater. Uh, and the museum is... Um, now, I said it'll never happen again. 
I'll correct myself, because the forthcoming Obama library is um, uh, a totally different creation. Um, basically, the archives will have very little to do with it. They're, they're building a museum, uh, a substantial museum, uh, I think on the Chicago lakefront. Um, and I believe they, they will, uh, over time, get copies. But see, most, most of the material in today's presidential library is not in the form, uh, traditionally, of, of papers, you know, a presidential diary or the president's secretary's file, which is what you would head for first if you were going to the Roosevelt Library. Go back to the, the four years were what? Four years were, were um, um, 96 to 2001. And um, the next then, library. Then actually, I uh, went to Lawrence, Kansas, uh, the other half of the Ford Dole ticket, to to build and not only physically but programmatically uh, the Dole Institute of Politics. How long were you in Lawrence, Kansas? There for about two and a half years. Um, and I know what you're thinking. I mean, you don't stay very long. Well, no, I, was, I, I was, wasn't thinking that. No, no, but, but people, people are thinking that, and, and, it's, and, it, and they're right. Um, I, I was, uh, well, first of all, I, I look at, I was six years in West Branch, Iowa. I was six years at Ford. Um, I think that's a pretty good run. But the point is, you know, I never wanted to be a caretaker. I didn't want to have a job just of a job. I wanted to do sub, substantial things. The Hoover is a great example. You know, we doubled visitation. We created a whole series of programs. We literally physically reinvented the place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And and, and I say I. It wasn't I. I mean, a lot of people um, who were willing to, to to buy into that more ambitious vision. On a, uh, stay on, on the uh, schedule of your life. After 2001, after Dole, after Lawrence, Kansas, what then? The Lincoln Library. Uh, in Springfield, Illinois, which of course was not open, um, and it was already, well, put it this way, it was, it's not part of the National Archives system. It's run by the state of Illinois, which was both its salvation and its burden. Salvation in the short term, because the state of Illinois at that point, believe it or not, was feeling flush, and the governor, um, Governor Ryan, uh, very generously, almost on a whim, said, basically, we'll, we'll pay for it. Well, they paid for a substantial part of it. The federal government, through Senator Durbin in particular, Senator Fitzgerald, um, or, I'm sorry, Fitzpatrick? Isn't that awful? Senator who succeeded, uh, who was succeeded by Carol Mosley Braun. Fitzgerald, I believe. Was it Fitzgerald? Because remember, there was the prosecutor was, he wasn't uh, there the, very the, long. No, he was there one term. One term, yeah. yeah very, I think he very lives decent, a, very decent man. I think he lives uh, but, around here now. But I think he, I think he kind of got fed up. In some ways, he was a man ahead of his time. He was frustrated by the way, even then, that the Senate was operating or not operating. In any event, was it Peter Fitzgerald? Peter Fitzgerald. Yeah, yeah. and um, and Paul Simon. Um, and they were they were very supportive. You have to remember this project had begun to attract some negative press. Um, you know anything in Illinois, particularly anything that big, that visible, is going to be uh, an attractive object for politicians. Politicians who want jobs, who want whatever, jobs for friends. In any event. I uh, naively um, accepted the invitation. Governor Bogoyevich, who actually re recruited me, and um, but it, the the, uh, the people who really deserve credit, um, Julie Salini, a, a woman in Springfield, Illinois, um, and Susan Mogerman, friends. And and they had a vision. Julie had a vision. And she saw all of this wonderful Lincoln 
memorabilia in the in the basement of the old state capitol where the Illinois State Historical Library was located under the parking as I recall and um, and it was it was wonderful stuff including one of the I think three existing four existing copies of the Gettysburg Address in Lincoln's own hand and her vision was um, why are we literally um, walking all of this priceless historical treasure trove away where the public can't see it. And she thought of creating, in effect, a Lincoln Presidential Library. Now, it's a bit of a misnomer in the sense that the Presidential Library system as we know it, run by National Archives, consists of a very large archive, even the smallest of the library. The Hoover Library has about 7 million pages of paper. You know, and obviously the later presidents have much, much more. Well, the Lincoln collection, you know, Lincoln's papers have been scattered over the years. The, the largest collection of presidential papers is at the Library of Congress, as you know. But so it wouldn't be a presidential library in in that quantitative sense. Nevertheless, um, the, basically, the basis of it was the old Illinois State Historical Library which told, as the name suggests, the history of Illinois. And then, critically, there would be attached a world-class, state-of-the-art museum. Now, that actually only recognized the reality of the presidential library system, where 99% of the people who visit never set foot in the archives. They go to the museum. Uh, um, and at the same time, Julie was not in any way limited by all the rules and regulations that the federal government imposes upon the current library system. So in, in, in a sense, she had a, a, a wide open field to operate. Uh, and they hired, and it was very much a grassroots initiative, but very, very much the singular vision of, of her and a, and a handful of other people. So anyway, they uh, they uh, hired um, BRC, which is an exhibits firm, which as I understand it was kind of a spin-off in some ways of the old Disney Imagineers. It, it, it imported a lot of that talent and, and they thought outside the box. The bill reflected that fact, but so did the exhibits. I mean, we spent an extensive period of time on opening day and since then millions have have flocked to Springfield and overwhelmingly they come away uh, praising this experience. Now part of my job was to use whatever credibility I had both as a historian and as someone who would run several libraries to counter the negative press. Um, there was a man named John Y. Simon since deceased, best known and admired for his role uh, at the head of the Ulysses Grant papers. Well, anyway, John Y., as he was universally known, had a shtick. Uh, he knew exactly what it took to get the press to come to Carbondale and interview him. He was at Southern Illinois University. That's right, Southern Illinois University. And, he, uh, and that was to rail against the rubber Lincolns at the... Uh, at the putative Lincoln Library. And of course the press, you know, bit every time. And um, and I had to point out there were no rubber Lincolns. <laughs> but but in any event, it was it was kind of a you know, it was almost a game. The one thing I knew, and this this applies to so many projects. Something is as unlike the World War II Memorial is a great example. Here in town. Yeah. In the abstract while these things are on the drawing board, before people can see them and experience them, they attract a host of critics. i never forget, Bob Dole had a characteristically wonderful Bob Dole line. The, the people who didn't want to build the World War II, they created something called Save Our Mall. And Dole's rejoinder was, we already saved it <laughs> once. It was called World War II. <laughs> and uh, anyway, 
I, I can't top that um, in Springfield. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, once the place was built, once people saw it, and I mean, they, they came in droves. Um, and, and, and my view is, uh, there are things I would do differently. Uh, there, were, there were areas where I thought maybe, you know, popular appeal perhaps crowded out a little bit of necessary scholarly restraint. But for the most part, my test of the success of a museum, and I'm talking about history museums, not art museums, which are very, which are very different. In an art museum, you know, it's enough to, to put a painting on the wall or a sculpture in a glass box. People simply, you know, observe and take away whatever inspiration they do. People increasingly today, though, particularly in a history museum, they want an experience. They want to, you know, look over Lincoln's shoulder at Gettysburg. Um, and beyond that, so I think, you know, I think that's a legitimate kind of intellectual inquiry. Um, and we shouldn't be ashamed recognizing it and addressing it. But beyond that, you leave a museum wanting to know more. Richard Norton Smith is an American historian and author. You can listen to more interviews with him by searching his name in the video library at cspan.org.